AI video is getting insane. Look at how lifelike and realistic this is. Uh, wait a minute, I'm getting a report. This just in, uh, this is not AI video. This is a unitary robot going head to head with a human opponent. And uh, he's doing pretty well, I gotta say. For something that weighs, what, like 100 pounds? This thing is uh, definitely, you know, punching above its weight. I think is the right way to say it. Oof, I spoke too soon. This is real and it's coming into a uh, live streaming monitor near you. I will 100% see this. There's there's no chance I'm missing this. Maybe we'll do a live stream to uh, check it out. But there's been tons of AI news that we need to cover. So without any further uh, glorious robotic violence, uh, let's get into it. But first, let's just check this out for one second. So there's this idea of a bucket list, something you want to do before you die. Some of the experiences that you wanted to have while you're still here on the planet, I've never really subscribed to that idea. I feel like that just changed because I would like to do this. This just seems like it would be endlessly entertaining. Unitree is a Chinese company and it's been extremely impressive with their robotic progress. One interesting thing about them that I recently learned is they are open sourcing a lot, at, at least some of their technology. They want to have a kind of an open developer ecosystem so that people come in there, contribute, maybe teach the robot new skills, use the various, um, I believe they use the NVIDIA Isaac Gym, where you're able to train certain skills in a simulation. It's something that I personally am very excited about. And also the idea, I mean, if you're getting your robots from a company that maybe you're not very familiar with, maybe it's not in the country that you're from, like in the United States, you kind of know the rules and regulations, et cetera. I feel like it's safe to say that maybe some people would have some hesitancy about having some sort of a robot in their house manufactured in China. U.S. and China obviously don't have the greatest relationship. So I feel like having some of that stuff open source does alleviate some of those concerns. Let me know what you think about that. But they're going to be live streaming this fight within the next month or so, or they said in about a month. So once we have the dates, we're definitely going to be watching that. I will do my best to have a live stream set up so we can all watch it together. I always feel bad when they kick and push and shove these robots to demonstrate kind of their ability to, you know, their stability, their ability to quickly get up, recover, etc. I feel like it's a lot more okay in this context. Like, it's fine. You know, he's got gear, he's got gloves, he's got the, the pads, he's got the headgear, head protection, so it's totally fine. Also, that kick, though, phenomenal. I mean... And the recovery from the, the, the guy's kick. It's just, there's so many things about this that I'm really enjoying. Anyways, let's move on. One of the things that caused a lot of interest recently is two quote-unquote stealth models that have appeared on Open Router. The first one to appear was called Quasar. Now, what we mean by stealth models is a lot of these labs, these AI labs, they sort of allow their yet-to-be-unreleased models to be tested on various platforms so people can get their hands on it, test it out. But we don't know who made the model or what that model's actual name is, or any details about it, etc. This is, of course, great for the companies. It allows them to do basic user testing, get a lot of feedback in kind of in the real world. And so the first model to drop was the Quasar model. And shortly after, we got the Optimus Alpha. By the way, thanks to Testing Catalog on Twitter for pointing some of this out. So first and foremost, I guess we're kind of assuming that they're both from the same company. And we'll, we'll get to who that is in just a second. But the Optimus Alpha, from what a lot of people have been saying, is notably good at coding. And it comes with a 1 million context window. So here's Optimus Alpha, 1 million token context length, available for free during the stealth period. So this probably costs sort of millions of dollars in API credits and compute for these companies, but that's the retail price. I mean, of course, it's probably a lot cheaper for them, but it's an excellent way to kind of, for them to test these products out in the wild and for us to kind of look at what's just around the corner, what's going to be released soon. So it's very fast. It's a 1 million context window. It seems to be excellent for coding. As far as we can tell, it's not a reasoning model. 
Now, interestingly, Sam Alvin was talking about being extremely excited about some of the new features that are about to launch. We'll go into those in just a second. Sam Alvin jumped in and said that quasars are very bright things. So first of all, I love the wordplay. So first of all, quasars are very bright sort of galactic objects that are very luminous, as they say. They emit a lot of light, but also, I mean, bright. This is a smart model. It's a bright model. So this seems to me to confirm that OpenAI is behind that stealth model quasar. So does that mean that Optimus Alpha is also part of that? Last time they tested it, two models at the same time, I think they had a good little chatbot and also a good little chatbot or, or something like that. It was some weird, strange name. So it's very possible that they're testing those side by side. And this likely means that we're going to see them pretty soon. Could those be the O4 Mini, O4 Mini High? So a lot of this is rumor, speculation. We're going to know for sure probably very, very soon. Let me know if you have any insights into this. I've messed around with the Optimus Alpha a little bit. It does not seem like a reasoning model. It gives the output almost immediately. It's very fast. There's no sort of a preamble. There's no thinking. It seems to troubleshoot pretty well, but we might cover it more in a separate video. So it seems like OpenAI is preparing to launch as many as three new AI models. That's the O4 Mini, the O4 Mini High, and O3. So we're going to have the GPT 4.0, so non-reasoning. We're going to have GPT 4.5, non-reasoning. But that's the one that's sort of uh, a lot of creativity, a lot more natural language. That's the one that wrote that little short story, the meta-fictional short story that I think we're all just like very divided on. I, I kind of loved it. It definitely invoked some uh, feelings, uh, stirred some emotions, if you will. A lot of people hated it, but I think that was more a response to the fact that it was AI generated rather than like if you, if you said, hey, here's a stor short story that I wrote. What do you think about it? People might be like, oh, it's great. That's just my take. But the point is, so we have those non-reasoning models and three reasoning models, the O1, O3 mini, and O3 mini high. GPT-4 is going away, which is kind of an end of an era, so to speak. Although I think they did at some point upgrade that to the GPT-4 turbo. So I guess the original GPT-4 has been gone for a while now. But this seems to suggest that we're going to get the O4 mini, O4 mini high, and the O3, which I thought Sam Altman said that the O3 will not be released as a standalone. And I think there was some back and forth on that. So maybe that changed. As the Matt Berman uh, reports here on uh, Twitter, Quasar Alpha is a mysterious 1 million token context model that beats Cloud 3.7 Sonnet on benchmarks while running Forex faster. But no one knows which lab created it. I was so confused about who made this post at first. He looks so different. Like, did he get a haircut? What's what's happening here? And he's got some big names following him. I, you know what? I'm just going to stay out of this one. But I was kind of confused for a second. I do think that's his real name. So I guess let's all welcome yet another Matt to the uh, AI space. If you're not aware, there's like five people on YouTube that are covering AI whose name is Matt or Matthew. But here's yet another Matt taking it to the next level. But let's move on. But staying on the subject of O3, apparently, according to some articles and some insiders at OpenAI, they're saying that maybe there's a little bit of a less of a priority on the safety testing of these models. According to this source, they're saying they used to have more thorough safety testing, but now there's more demand for it and Sam Altman wants it out faster. So I can't confirm this story. So it looks like here they're referencing Daniel Cocotalo. We've covered one of his recent blog posts that he made, uh, the AI takeover by 2027. And in another video, we'll go into some of the details, but I feel like their sort of a tech progression forecasts and timelines are excellent. And then their sort of prediction of how society is impacted, how society responds, how the various geopolitical stuff plays out. I personally don't see that as accurate, but again, that's just one person's opinion. But I feel like Daniel gets a lot of respect for standing up to open AI and the non-disparagement clause. So when he left, he wanted more protection for the whistleblowers, for people that had sort of the guts to stand up and say, hey, we're not doing enough AI safety testing, etc." It seemed like OpenAI did have some sort of clauses that the employees assigned when they joined that would have a sort of a chilling effect on their ability to, to say anything negative for fear of losing OpenAI equity, which of course would be, you know, massive amounts of money. I think Daniel at some point said that something like 80 or 90% of his family's net worth were basically OpenAI equity. So imagine kind of like standing up and saying something negative about the company that you used to work for having the guts to do that, even though maybe 90% of your family's entire net worth might be wiped out with that, with that statement. It certainly takes a lot of guts. Now, keep in mind, this is a video that I did two months ago about the O3 Mini, and it's the first dangerous autonomy model. 
I moved myself to cover my previous self on the screen because if there's like both of us on there at the same time, I feel like that'll cause some sort of a space-time rift sort of thing. So just, just being safe. But as you know, OpenAI, Anthropic, Google, they all have a sort of their own version of a AI safety preparedness protocol or, or whatever they call it. It's sort of like they evaluate how each new model they release, how potentially dangerous it could be. And so the O3 Mini had sort of the distinction of being the first model to reach medium risk on the model autonomy, on their preparedness framework evaluations. So before it was low, it went to medium. And high, I feel like, is a fairly big next leap forward because at high, we're talking about sort of recursive self-improvement. It's able to autonomously conduct machine learning research. So here's that paper from OpenAI. So model autonomy is one of the four categories that they're evaluating the sort of preparedness framework in. And so they're defining high as this AI model can execute open-ended novel machine learning tasks on a production machine learning code base that would constitute a significant step on the critical path to model self-improvement. And the reason why this might be a concern is that solving open-ended tasks offers an immediate speed up for AI research and it demonstrates a strong level of long context understanding and adaptation, right? So the next step beyond that is the ability to survive and replicate in the wild. So high is kind of where it's still not quite that scary potential rogue AI scenario, but where, where it is sort of already contributing significantly to potentially machine learning, for example. It's a huge speed up for AI research development. And keep in mind, that's the O3 mini that we were just talking about. That was that sort of medium. That was the first model to hit that medium threshold on the model autonomy. So wherever the O3 lands, it's going to be sort of better and more capable than the O3 mini. So yeah, it definitely feels like we're accelerating here. Thanks to Nick for pointing this out. And finally, the really big release that happens. So OpenAI hasn't released those models yet, but we did get a sort of a mini in-between release. And that is infinite memory, or I guess it's memory in ChatGPT that can reference all of your past chats to provide more personalized responses. One interesting thing that people have sort of mentioned is that, and I've encountered this as well, I use it for work a lot, also for some personal stuff. And it would be sort of interesting to kind of maybe split those memories into two different buckets, if you will, to maybe kind of like just sever them and, and move them apart so that they're severed, you know. One that you would only use when you're kind of at work. So it's only for like in the work environment and one for the, you know, like the, the out outside of work, if that makes sense. As Ethan Malik put it here, I totally get why AI long-term memory is useful. And based on my testing, I think many people will love it. But I actually don't want my LMs I use for work to chime in with personal details or suddenly change its answers as a result of my past interactions. Boundaries are good. Very well said. Noam Brown jumps in. Now, Noam Brown, the researcher at OpenAI, he used to work for Meta and worked on the Cicero Diplomacy AI. He jumps in and says, maybe we'll go full severance and you can have your any ChatGPT and your Audi ChatGPT, which I thought was just excellent. Terrific, terrific. Now, if you haven't been watching the series Severance, last few minutes probably didn't make any sense to you, and I apologize for that. It's a good show. I am quite enjoying it. So those were some of the AI news I wanted to cover for today. These AI news should be very pleasing, but try to enjoy each one equally.